So how significantly will this treatment affect Canadians in the midst of this Omicron wave? Dr. Howard New is the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer. Dr. Supriya Sharma is the Chief Medical Advisor with Health Canada. Dr. Sharma, Dr. New, thanks so much for making time for us. Thank you. And Dr. Sharma, I will start with you. The term game changer, you know, gets thrown around quite a bit. Canadians have certainly heard a lot of promises through this pandemic. What will this pill actually change for us? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've lost track of how many times the game has changed. I think the important thing is that we do have a new medication. It's actually a combination of two different medications um, that could be very useful for people who are at high risk of having very severe illness with COVID-19. And the importance for this one that's different from the other treatments that we have is that it's in pill form. So you can take it by mouth, you can take it outside of hospital, you don't need an injection or an infusion. And, and you know, we know how um, strapped are our healthcare systems are. So if we can prevent people from, you know, needing to be in hospital or in the intensive care unit or even, you know, dying from COVID-19, that's a that's a very good thing. Once someone tests positive, Dr. Sharma, how quickly does it need to be given? How quickly do they need to take this pill in order for it to work? Right. So we'll, in terms of when it's taken, we really focus on when the symptoms first start. So you, you count from the times when you first start having symptoms and the medication should really be started within five days. Now, we want the medication to be used in people who have confirmed COVID-19. So you also have to have a positive test that can be a rapid antigen test or it can be a, a PCR molecular test. But you need that, you know, catch it early within five days of the symptoms starting and having a positive test and being of high risk already um, for, for having severe disease. There are a few obstacles, though, and Dr. New, I'll ask you about that. How is the federal government, how are you going to make sure that these pills are actually going to get to people who need it, given how uneven, and I hate to say even messy in some cases, other rollouts have been, and the fact people can't even get tested when they need to in many cases? That's a very good question. Uh, one of the things that we've done at the Public Health Agency of Canada is that we actually developed a with the help of an ad hoc uh, group of clinical experts, what we call interim considerations uh, for the use of uh, Paxlovid, uh, certainly in the context of limited supply. And I understand uh, our ministers uh, uh, this uh, this afternoon uh, did uh, articulate how many uh, treatment courses we can expect, you know, immediately and uh, sort of for the rest of this quarter. I think it's about 30,400 treatment courses, uh, you know, uh, coming within the next few days, uh, being distributed to the provinces and territories, and then uh, another 120,000 uh, uh, courses uh, uh, throughout, uh, I guess, to the end of March. And so with that kind of supply, I think it's a, manage, it's a matter of managing expectations. And so with our document, uh, we actually clearly uh, put out to the province territories uh, what we think is probably the best use in terms of the priority populations, as uh, Dr. Sharma alluded to. Uh, certainly anyone who's moderately or severely uh, immunocompromised would, would certainly be a candidate to, to get this treatment, as well as those uh, who are older, because we know that older people are more at risk of getting uh, more severe consequences. So definitely anyone over the age of 80 who uh, is not uh, up to date uh, with their uh, vaccinations, and then uh, anyone over the age of 60 who uh, obviously also might be living in a certain circumstance that makes it uh, harder to, let's say, access treatment if they live in a remote or isolated community, if they're in a long-term care facility, uh, you know, uh, situations such as that. Obviously, Indigenous communities would also be a consideration, as well as any other setting in which social determinants, uh, we know that in terms of disparities or inequities in health uh, are also important in terms of the types of outcomes we've seen uh, among Canadians so far. Beyond, though, uh, underscoring in those documents to the provinces uh, who needs to get these, who should be prioritized, we've seen healthy supplies of, of rapid tests and things like that not be rolled out quickly and efficiently. People who are not feeling well cannot get their hands on rapid tests, let alone get a PCR test. So that's the part of the the, the equation that, that I think a lot of people are, are concerned about. Excited, perhaps, that this, this is now approved and we've got some stock already. But how are you going to ensure that the provinces, is there a mechanism in place to ensure that the provinces roll this out in a, in a more smooth fashion? Yep. Well, what I could say is obviously the federal government is committed to, you know, having hundreds of millions of, 
of uh, rapid tests along with obviously supporting uh, you know the, the PCR laboratory testing in the provinces and territories. I think uh, with the document that we put out today, I think it's already happening on the ground. Uh, certainly the clinical experts uh, we've engaged in terms of uh, developing the document, uh, uh, they're, they're telling us that you know with their colleagues uh, in terms of the high risk groups, uh, they're certainly those are the, the patients that are being prioritized uh, to get access to testing you know, as is feasible in their jurisdictions. And so uh, certainly uh, I think uh, the province and territories, I think uh, are gonna use uh, our document uh, hopefully to their best advantage, uh, making sure that the, the right people who are at greatest risk and could benefit the most from this medication would be the ones that have access to the tests as they need them if they do develop uh, symptoms. And then hopefully uh, if they get a, a positive test, not that they get a positive test, but if they do get a positive test, then they'll have access to, to the medication as well. And Dr. Sharma, so it, it does sound like the unvaccinated will be a, a big part of the group that's that's going to be focused on with these with these pills. But you know, unfortunately, that the unvaccinated don't trust the process, the science, or pharmaceutical companies. So, how are you going to get them to use these antivirals, even if they're not feeling well? You know, absolutely. I mean, I think with any medication, whether it's uh, this medication or something else, that it's important that people know the risks and the benefits of the treatments, but also the risks and benefits of not having those treatments. And so for somebody that, you know, is a potential candidate for this, it means having those discussions early, um, letting them know what kind of risks that they potentially are are uh, facing. We know that unvaccinated people have as up to, up to a 20 times higher likelihood of ending up in hospital and ICU than someone who is vaccinated. So, you know, having the discussion about if we catch something early, this is a medication that can be used to potentially prevent that really serious illness if you're at risk. We know Health Canada has also been reviewing the experimental pill that Merck uh, is, has offered to you to, to be tested and for your consideration. Any sense uh, of when that might be approved? Right, so that, that's the molnupiravir uh, medication. It's an antiviral as well. It's taken by mouth as well. Uh, it works in a slightly different way than Paxlovid, and we're still looking at that. There's still some questions around um, how it works and how well it works, as well as on the side effects side of things. So, so no firm timeline on the completion of that yet, but we are actively working on that on a priority basis. On Paxlovid, though, back to what you were saying about, you know, informing people about the side effects and things like that. There are side effects and contraindications that take a lot of people out of the equation in terms of being able to, to take this and feel good about taking it. What are your concerns around that? How do you tell Canadians that, that approving this is the right move right now? Right. So, I mean, that's exactly what we do. When we do the reviews, we look at um, risks and benefits. And we would only authorize a medication if those benefits outweigh the potential risks. And if you look overall at risks in the clinical trials for Paxlovid, if we just put the drug interaction piece aside uh, for a second, the group actually that was not getting the medication reported more side effects than the group that was getting the medication. And there are some that are, are a bit more common, you, you know, a change in your taste, um, some, some diarrhea, um, some uh, blood pressure changes. But really, as you noted, the, the main concern is around the way that this these medications interact, potentially interact with other medications. And there's a, there's a list of medications where you can't take this, you can't take them with Paxlovid, and then there's other ones that have other interactions and maybe you can either stop taking a medication for a period of time or adjust the dose to make sure that you don't have side effects from that medication and that it works well. Now, you know, it does have a lot of drug interactions, but we're also used to other medications that have drug, drug interactions. So that's why it's important to have discussions with the pharmacist or your, your healthcare provider to see if it's right for you. But for the people who can take it, again, if they're already at a high risk of being in hospital, it actually does work quite, quite well to prevent that serious illness. And Dr. New, a question for you about something that is certainly on the mind of people right across this country, and that is schools. Once the snow passes in some of the provinces, like Ontario, who are dealing with it, uh, they are going to go back to school, as was the plan today, and there will be better masks. That's the promise, at least, better ventilation. But others are not following that. So what is the best advice right now for safe schools in the context of Omicron, in your view? Well, in my view, I think uh, we all recognize that the schools are so important for 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 their, our children in terms of you know not just sort of the learning academically, but in terms of their social development, their mental health, and so on. And so I think uh, 
the kids have really suffered quite a bit uh, with uh, school closures and you know, online learning and so on. So my personal view, I would say, is that, you know, uh, we, we should have kids return to school. We can make schools as safe as possible. There's never a, what I would say zero risk, but if we uh, put all the right measures in place in terms of you know use of face masks and so on, we can make uh, schools a, a safer place. But recognizing as well that it's not just about the schools; it's also what's happening in the community. You know what happens at schools is often a reflection of the community transmission, and so I would still encourage that it's not uh, about protecting the kids, you know, having them get vaccinated, but also the adults at home and. Uh, those in the, in the general community to also uh, uh, get vaccinated because the more we can have an impact on community transmission, uh, the safer it will be for everyone in any type of setting. Has Omicron changed the math on when we can hope, hope for a return to normal? I'll yeah. ask you first, Dr. New, and then Dr. Sharma. Well, I, I think we, I actually, I think I answered the question or <laughs> responded to it uh, uh, earlier on, on Friday with our modeling session, but I would say that, uh, you know, certainly with the Omicron variant, uh, I think one thing I would say is that yes, if you do get uh, uh, the, you know infected with this variant, uh, you would get obviously immunity against this particular variant for let's say a, a certain period of time. But we all know that uh, based on our experience with the other variants, that uh, it's not necessarily lifelong, and you could uh, uh, become infected by uh, maybe even a future variant. So uh, that's something that needs to be kept in mind. Uh, as well, you know, if uh, you know someone gets infected with Omicron, yes, maybe at an individual level, you might have a quote milder illness. But if you look at the sheer numbers of, uh, you know, uh, let's say even if it's a smaller percentage of the population needing uh, hospital care and so on, the absolute numbers can be uh, obviously a staggering and uh, you know basically overload our healthcare system. So I don't think we can take it lightly. And uh, as we say, uh, you know, the vaccines are still probably the best and safest and surest way to. Uh, Develop that that protective immunity for however long that lasts uh, compared to uh, uh, when you get natural infection. The question of what we call end endemicity or whether uh, you know uh, COVID-19 becomes endemic, I think, is uh, something we need to uh, look at in terms of what is the balance in our society in terms of accepting a certain level of transmission with uh, associated morbidity and hopefully uh, uh, really trying to avoid severe mortality. Uh, with, with obviously the tools we have in place right now. You know, I think uh, the weeks and months ahead uh, will tell us uh, what we might still need to do, but uh, hopefully uh, we are heading towards a better place uh, compared to where we were a year or so ago. And Dr. Sharma, really quickly from you. Um, I would just say this is, a bit, this is a very humbling virus. And, um, you know, I think we really need to respond to how it's evolving. I think we have, uh, you know, more tools in the toolkit here, whether it's vaccinations or treatments, but really it's a global effort. And until we can get everyone vaccinated and we can get cases under control internationally, then we're going to keep seeing, I think, waves and we're going to keep um, having to respond to them. However, I think, you know, we will get through this wave as we have with others and there definitely are better times coming. Dr. Sharma, Dr. New, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.